Thank you. Stop clapping, I only got 15 minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes to talk about what I learned from 150 guys, okay. Um, so this is what I learned from 150 of the top editors. Um, these are five of the books that I have written, if you haven't read any of the books that I've written. Uh, this is the one that I'm most proud of. You're not supposed to have a favorite child, but this is definitely it. Um, 50 editors from 19 countries, 12 Oscar winners, 40 Oscar nominees, numerous semi winners, more than a thousand years of editing uh, wisdom, and over a thousand films and over a thousand TV shows. So this is a bunch of people that really know what they're talking about. Um, and it's curated into a virtual roundtable conversation about the topics editors need to know. And um, since the book, I've done an additional 90 interviews. So I want to talk a little bit about what what I've learned from those people. I, I really, one of the reasons why I did this series is because I was cutting films and I, I didn't really work my way up through the assistant editor um, path that so many people get a chance to. And so didn't really have a mentor. I've uh, been editing for 32 years, but I don't, I don't know that I know what I'm doing. And so it was really exciting for me to sit down and talk to these, these guys and really learn um, uh, at their feet, basically. Um, one of the big things that I learned was, uh, because I, I'm, I do think I'm a very experienced editor, and like probably most of us, if you guys, editors out there, is everybody, yeah, pretty much everybody, you, you know what you're doing, right? You're, you know, hey, I cut it, this is the way it is, live with it, you know? I, I'm the editor, this is great, right? Um, but uh, I really have learned that I need to back my ego off a little bit. You need to have an ego so you have, you know that you have something to say, you know, you know you have input into the final product, but you have to also realize your job is really to deliver the director's vision. So remember when you're collaborating, remember it's not about you, it's about the final product. Another thing is bad ideas can lead to good ideas. Um, this is just a huge thing. You, you think, uh, you know, somebody says just the stupidest thing in the world, and you're like, okay, that's just dumb. I'm not going to do that. But I want to point out a great story that I learned from Joe Walker. Joe was cutting, um, uh, no, uh, yeah, Arrival. So he was cutting Arrival. They, they didn't shoot a scene where they wanted Amy Adams' character to be dreaming like the, in the alien language. I don't know if you're, like if you learn a new language, that's one of the ways you know you're really learning Spanish or Russian or whatever because you start dreaming in that language. So they wanted a scene like that, but they did not shot it. And he goes, here's what I think we can do. If we take this one shot from this one scene that wasn't shot for this purpose and then that other shot from this scene and then we get the graphics guys to make like an alien monster thing and then, we will just make a scene and Joe's like that's never gonna work but what did he do he put the scenes together like the director said and he's like yeah it doesn't work but I can see that this might actually work and so they then they started to build and they started to go so this idea that seemed like there's no way you could just build a scene without reshoots build a scene from nothing sure enough they were able to do it so be careful not to let your ego get in the way of saying that you can't do something. Also deciding what stays and goes needs to be a process. This is a big thing for me as an editor. One of the first feature films that I worked on, I cut, I got the scene and, and you guys probably know the old adage for script writers that you get into the scene as late as possible and you get out as early as possible, right? That's always what you try to do. And so what did I do? I looked at the scene, I'm like, oh, we don't need the first four lines and we don't need the last three lines. And I cut it together and showed it to the director. He's like, whoa, whoa, what happened to my scene? I'm like, I, I, you, you don't need those lines and you don't need those lines. He goes, I need them, I need to see what they are. And, and sure enough, you know, in my own defense, when we got to the end of the film, those lines were all cut. So I was right, but do you think you get hired again by saying I told you so? No, the answer is no, you do not get hired again by saying I told you so. So I kept that to myself, but what I didn't realize was the director needs to get on board with it just like you did. You made those decisions. The director can't see that unless he gets to see the whole thing. And he lives with that for a while and, and, and a month goes down and he goes, ah, do you think we really need those lines? I'm like, not really. And you know, oh, maybe we don't. And then another month goes by. I really think we should cut those lines. Let me see, see how that looks. And you cut them out and he plays it and, it and that's the way it ends up. So you need to go, you know what, I'm just gonna trust the process and let, let it go a couple of weeks before I make those kind of decisions. So 
That's it. So the director needs to see things for, for himself. And he's never going to own that choice. If you don't let him see it the way he saw it, that he wants it, he's never going to own that choice unless he makes that choice. You can't just tell him it's going to be better because he'll always wonder or she will always wonder. When you deliver your editor's cut, leave your ego at the door. Martin Scorsese has a great quote. Your movie is never as good as the dailies or as bad as the first cut. And that's kind of an indictment of us, right? Because you're like, oh, that means the crappiest part of this is when the editor is left alone. Now, granted, we have, to do, we have to put in the entire movie, and we have to do it the way the script is, so that's kind of part of the problem. But leave your ego at the door because there's going to be a lot of revisions and a lot of complaints and a lot of uh, criticism of your work. Uh, exploring something that is not the solution may lead to the solution. Always allow a bad suggestion to lead to a good suggestion. This guy's brilliant. Uh, oh, <laughs> Steve Hoffish, never mind. Um, and then I love uh, Joe Walker's quote, keep the clay moist. There's no point in saying this wor won't work. We're all in the, in the nonlinear age of being able to edit in Avid or Final Cut or Premiere or whatever you like to edit in. Um, and you... There's, back in the film days, if somebody said, oh, could we re-edit this, you'd have to you know, take the film apart and put the film back together and get your trims out of some bin and do all this work. In our day and age, you might as well just do it because it's faster to just have that discussion in the NLE than to have it sitting around a, a table. So um, keep the clay moist. There's no point in saying this won't work. Um, editing is editing. This seems like a really stupid quote, but I think it's uh, really important. So many young editors think, I cut it this way, it's great, I made a fantastic first cut, I'm done. No. Um, I've written six books, I've written countless magazine articles. If you've ever written a term paper in college, if you write it the night before and you hand it in, it's going to suck. But if you write it days and days and days ahead and then you work at it and work at it and fix it and clean it, that is when you're going to have a great project. And so no matter how good that first cut is, you need to realize that you need to keep working. You need to keep refining that when it goes together in context and you start to see the context of it, all of that stuff is going to change how you work. And so you just might as well be open to it from the beginning of the process and go, okay, I did the first cut, but let's really get started working now because that's when the real editing begins. I, I think I've done 150 interviews I probably maybe talk to people that have cut 3,000 or 4,000 films. And out of all of those people, there are maybe stories of 20 people that cut one scene that never changed. That's it. You know, there are people that go, oh, yeah, that, the way you saw it in the film, that's exactly the way I cut it the first day. But that is so rare. So just be ready to revise. Editing a film is a continual process of refinement. A constant willingness to revise and continue to edit is what makes for a great final edit. Um, so uh, that is that. Um, Steve Markovich, you have to go through the steps. It's an evolution of the cut. This is just, it's just the process. And I don't know when it was, you know, maybe when I was cutting shorter form stuff that I really felt like as soon as I was done with the first pass, I was done. But certainly in editing a feature film, that first pass just can never be the last pass. You've got to keep going. Um, and you can only really know how to start a scene uh, when you see it in context with the scenes around it. This is one of those big things that uh, a lot of people talked about when they're having their assistants cut a, a piece. So, you know, Lee Smith, who cut Dunkirk and just won uh, an Oscar for it, says he lets his assistants cut all the time. And... Sometimes he'll give them a scene and, and he'll go back in there, you know, four hours later, five hours later, and they'll have, they might have a shot put into the timeline. He's like, what are you doing? They're like, well, I'm trying to find the perfect shot. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not the way this works. Because you don't even know what the scene is before this or what the shot is in this. You might know the scene because you read it. Maybe you're, you're diligent and you go, okay, I'm cutting scene 82, so I need to read scene 81 so I know what's leading into scene 82. And I need to read scene 83 so I know what's leading out of it when I'm cutting scene 82. But really, you can, when you cut uh, that scene, the context changes so much that... There are a lot of people that I've interviewed that they just say, I really dive right in. I don't worry about finding that perfect shot because if I spend so much time finding that perfect shot, 
one, by the time I've finished cutting the scene, I might have realized something that even just in that scene, the first shot's not right. Or once I do cut scene 81 into scene 82, I'll go, oh, this was the perfect shot, but now I'm cutting almost to the exact same shot from the exact same shot at the end of scene 81, so that's not gonna work. So now what do I do? And also, you might find when you cut scene 81 and scene 82 together that you wanna chop out the last five seconds of scene 81 and the first 10 seconds of scene 82, and so now that perfect shot is gone. So don't let, that, um, don't let yourself spend a lot of time doing that. And uh, this is exactly what this quote is about. When you put all the scenes together, the perception of what you have changes. Uh, that's Dan Hanley. And the story is elastic and you have to be prepared to bend with it. This is a really interesting um, concept for, if you haven't cut a feature film uh, yet, and I hope everybody in this room gets a chance to, um, one of the things that's really interesting is you think, oh, I cut a scene together and I put that scene next to this scene and then the whole thing is done and that makes the movie or, or it's the way that the script is. But so many movies are drastically restructured from what the scene, the original script was. I don't know whether you saw The Martian. Um, the Martian starts out with that whole, you know, the Mars storm and Matt Damon gets lost and, and they have to leave without him. That was scripted to be a flashback that was supposed to happen almost 90 minutes into the film, and that's the way it was cut for months and months and months, and it was only like a month or two before they finished editing where they were like, you know what, nobody is really, the, the, the audience isn't really liking these other characters, you know, that are going back to Earth. On the, they're, they're like, they left the guy, what a bunch of scumbags. And that's the way they felt about it because they didn't get a chance to see the flashback scene where they were truly trying to rescue him, and oh, where's Matt? You know, we gotta, we gotta, we can't leave without him. And then you realize that they have to. And so it was only when they moved that entire section back to the front of the picture that the audience's perception of the movie changed. So you have to realize that the story is elastic. It's something that you, as an editor, can mold at any time. You don't have to, you don't have to think, oh, there were, where there was this scene and this scene and this scene. Yeah, you know what, the, scene, the movie's getting kind of slow. You know, let's take all those scenes out and we'll just make a montage out of them. Great, do it. Or, you know what, um, there's a couple of really good scenes at the very front of the movie, but the beginning of the movie is kind of starting slow and really we want to, see, we want to get to the point where this happens, you know, where, where the two prot the pr protagonists and the antagonists meet. How quickly can we get to that? Oh, but we got all these great scenes. I don't know, stick them later in the movie and make them flashbacks. Or stick them later in the movie and pretend that that's where they go. So think about the elasticity of the story and don't be committed to the, to the way it's written. I hate for all of you screenwriters out there to hear that, but that's the way it goes. Uh, the approach to editing and the preparation to edit are the same. The goal is to organize the material and understand it. A lot of times that's about figuring out what could be ignored. I love that. You cannot possibly get through an entire feature film with 500 hours of dailies in your brain. It just doesn't happen. You've got to get to the point where you're like, okay, what, what is the real stuff that I'm going to make this scene from? So that's why a lot of people use selects reels. Um, I interviewed Joel Cox, uh, uh, um, Clint Eastwood's editor, like old school guy, and he's like, ah, selects reels are for sissies. You cut straight from the bin, let me tell you. That's the way it works. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. I will remember that. Biggest trick is to compartmentalize. Um, it's really about getting the material down to smaller bits so you can manage it and study it and compare it. That's why so many people do selects reels. You, you can't even, you know, if you've got 90 minutes to cut a one minute scene, you're, you can't wrap your head around 90 minutes of material. So you need to get it down to 12 minutes or seven minutes of material for a 90 second scene and then you go, oh, now I can see the way these things could go together, so you're always trying to refine. Some people don't do that in selects reels. Some people do it in bins by saying, oh, this is a good take, and that's a bad take, and they kind of move it around in the bin. That's a great method um, if you can do it, um, but you definitely need to start compartmentalizing and getting it down to smaller chunks, especially uh, for documentaries. Instead of trying to judge one shot that's three minutes long, I'm just trying to judge tiny beats. The reason why you would want to ignore circled takes and dailies is because the director is picking an entire scene, which you might, there might be the worst take of all where the, the, the whole thing's out of focus except for one second. That one second's the gold. So uh, don't worry too much about circled takes. Watching dailies is an actual skill. Remember how you shot or a moment originally made you feel. That's important because a lot of that can get lost when you're editing. 
And getting hired is about who you are, and my time is up. Um, and that is about it. And I want to leave you with this one final thing right here, <laughs> which is <laughs> this one. Maya Angelou, the great poet, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So remember that being in the edit suite and what you do in an audience. Thank you. Thank you.